Hello and welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. It has been a few weeks. We've all been busy and we're glad to be back tonight. We're going to start with the intros. How are you, Richard? Very well, thanks, Mark. Not too bad. Plenty going on, uh, as always. Um, but I'm sure we'll get into the nitty gritty of a few bits and pieces. Yeah, you've got a lot to answer for because apparently you've brought a whole new amendment out and it's all your fault. But before we get into that, how are you doing, Craig? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Just, you know, busy as we are, plodding away. Um, yeah, industry seems to be getting busier, which is nice. That's good to hear. I think it's it's still a bit up and down, for depending on who you speak to, but it's interesting to hear you're doing well. We'll maybe have a, a bit of a chat into that as well as we move through the discussion. But obviously, there's been quite a lot of talk already across social media and on other podcasts and video content that's been thrown out there around the new amendment to the to the wiring regs. And we're very lucky because, Richard, you're, you're part of some of those discussions as far as I understand. I don't want to misquote anything there, but I think that's fair to say. You have your fingers in those pies. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, as an organisation, um, you know, if, if a change is needed for safety reasons or potential safety reasons, then we are always going to be in favour of, of a change. So... There's going to be quite a bit of work in the background from ourselves and we've had a number of questions in the rag around this particular subject and um you know how we would potentially code it moving forward and we've had to kind of put that on hold for quite a while because you know um beamer obviously brought to everyone's attention that there may be a potential issue when certain devices can't cope with power flow going in both directions um, and of course, with the more you know appearance or prevalence of more solar PV systems, battery storage systems, vehicle to grid potentially moving forward, um, it's it's got to be a positive move, hasn't it? So still a lot of work to do in the background, and I'm I'm glad that it's out there for the DPC as well. So that's good. Um, there's a, you know a few bits and pieces I've been having a look at from an installer point this week, which I'll talk about in a bit. I've no doubt. Um, but, you know, a lot of people will see it as uh, another money-making scam. You know, it's all the IET's fault, et cetera. <laughs> but it isn't, you know, um, things are done for a, a reason, not to make money out of a new book, et cetera. Uh, and, of course, as and when it gets agreed, this will be a free to download one page that you can slot into your current 7671. Um, and, you know, it needs addressing and, you know, conversations need to be had and people need to understand more about it. And that's the point of the DPC. So... Exactly yeah, that, exactly that. So the draft for public comment to trainees and apprentices who, who aren't aware, you can go off and input into this. It's been put forward by industry. This is our opportunity, I think, till the 4th of June. I think that's the cut-off date. So you can go onto the BSI website. I'll pop a link in alongside this this podcast and read. It's only a page long. Read it mm -hmm. and put your comments in. I've been on tonight and put my comments in. I can see there's about 20 or 30 on each regulation or so. So people are feeding back. I think that's brilliant. Um, there's some of the things that are in there that I totally agree with and some little bits that I think may maybe be tweaked. Maybe I'll chat about that through the course of this podcast. But generally speaking, it, it's something that did need to be cleared up because of the change in technology. Um, I'll come to you and, and take your view, Craig, before I delve into all of that. But what, have you had a chance to look at this? Yeah, so I've had a read of it. I think what's interesting for me is I'm not in the solar PV and even really the car charging or battery space, so it's a, a different element for me. But I think there's, and hopefully we're going to go through this for my learning as much as everyone else, but I think there's definitely gaps in the industry of understanding why we need bi-directional devices, what we are potentially looking to in the future, understanding that we've got a couple of chapters of prosumerism and the confusion around island mode and i don't know if we almost have just enough information to be confused but not quite yet enough information to understand the full potential of the issue from somebody who's not installing this kit day to day um i think it's probably going to follow the same pattern as like when rcds came in and what 17th amendment 3 or something wasn't it and at that point rcds were just a money scam as well and it was all just a an issue which turned out to not be the case in my opinion and I hope it's seen in the manner that it's intent with I mean I've been lucky 
to have conversations, not about this stuff, but have conversations with people who sit on some of these panels and understand a bit more about what goes into it. And I think that's not commonly known about in the industry as much as it should be. And off the back of this, it sent me on looking at other product standards. And I'll talk about a cable a little bit later on because I think there is, although it's not to do with this DPC, I think it's about how we have to be aware of manufacturers' standards and product standards because I found something today that could possibly cause an issue for lots of installers, which we'll talk about. Oh no, Craig's found something else to throw the, the wasps back into the air, so that'll be something to get onto later. I think this, the, the way this stuff's used and was proposed to be installed has changed. So I, I see it as different now. If we look back 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of the inverter manufacturers were saying that their products needed 100 milliamp or 300 milliamp RCD protection because of the way they worked and the natural leakage yeah. that occurred from them. That generally pushed us towards RCCBs or RCDs, double double space ones. You know what I mean? The double module jobbies. Yes. Yeah. And you know they are bi-directional motors, as we're led to believe. So they will open. Um, in either direction and not blow themselves to pieces. So if you were using an RCD in that application, you weren't seeing this as a problem maybe. And now today, where a lot of the inverter manufacturers say you don't actually need to use RCD protection unless your cable installation method dictates you should. And in which case, that's when you need to consider the bi-directional aspect because although the energy would generally be flowing from the inverter back through the consumer unit, I mean, you could technically fit it upside down if it had fit in somehow without the buzz bar in. However, you wouldn't really want to be doing that. Um, but it is in one direction, isn't it, generally? But when you throw the battery storage in the mix and these hybrid inverters, that's not the case. It's going both ways all the time, and you need the product to tick off that particular circumstance, especially if the test button been pressed. I think that's been an issue. So there is a reason for this. As you said, Richard, there's, there's always yeah. a reason, isn't there? Um, yeah, so yeah. Something that's just been pulled off out of thin air by a manufacturer to try and sell products. I actually think this is making a problem for manufacturers because they've got products on shelves right now without the right markings on that they're going to struggle to sell. So they've made a bit of a problem for themselves there. So I don't think it's by design. It isn't, but if you're carrying out a periodic inspection and test as well and moving forward from this, when this um, gets released properly in the summer, then by looking at a device, if it's not clear as to whether it is bi-directional and it's on an existing installation that's an observation, you've then got to consider the potential danger and risk and then code appropriately. And um, it's not 100% clear, the markings on some of these devices. Some of the information is on the side of the device, which they are allowed to do because I've been delving into the product standard for them, BSCM 61009, and they are allowed to put some information on the side so that it does dictate whether it needs to be on the front or on the side or within the manufacturer's information. Um, but then, of course, when these devices are installed, there's no way of seeing the information on the side because you might have a number of devices that are all together and therefore you can't see the information on the side. So that's going to be difficult to determining whether or not it is um it's not always clear whether it's in out line load etc and you know Proteus, for instance have adopted a new symbol where you've got two arrows in a in a circle and within the product standard again it can be identified by arrows that's fine but that's on the front so that's quite helpful so moving forward you'd be able to categorically say that that is bi-directional because of the arrows the markings on it but then equally to find the product information for that on the website is very easy some of them aren't as easy to find um, and then, of course, if it is bi-directional, there's no, there's no real issue. If it's not, then it's a whole other debate on, you know, what's the risk and what's the likelihood and therefore how we're going to code it. And that's something as an organisation that we'll be putting through RAG eventually to try and get some sensible information and a sensible approach where we all, mm. you know, all the organisations that contribute towards the RAG, we come up with something sensible and hopefully then that will be pushed out into, into BPG4 and uh, ultimately, we're going to be rewriting BPG3, which is all about solar and, you know, all those uh, adopting technologies. So interesting conversations. But again, I have been delving into a couple of the manufacturers and the product standard because, you know, it's not going to be easy for someone carrying out a periodic inspection and test. From a designing point, then, of course, you can 
go to the manufacturers. They'll give you some guidance as a couple of manufacturers protests we've already mentioned. Hey, go, have these products available currently. So it shouldn't be an issue then when you're selecting and designing and, you know, installing, but it's from an existing installation and there's thousands of these systems being installed. Isn't it? That's, that's where there's going to be more conversation. And bearing in mind about being the one who's going to ask all the silly questions tonight, because I might as well be an apprentice in this part of the industry. Well, most of it, to be fair. <laughs> um, I assume, from an EICR point of view, then there is no way to test the bidirectional function of these. No, I don't think there's a test you could perform on it without blowing it to pieces by pushing the test button while it's running in reverse. It's it's a difficult one, like like Richard just alluded to it it's code in this because normally when you get a change in a regs you know the default behavior is that you start c3 in some of these things mm -hmm. and recommend an improvement and then as time maybe moves along if it could be viewed as potentially been dangerous i guess you could up, up that code but that's kind of base camp of where you sit isn't it when there's a change in regulations or certainly we do other people might approach it differently i think it's engineering judgment with this if you're looking at a really old inverter that would require an rcd that generally takes it beyond using a single module RCBA. It's not going to be in the installation anyway. If it's something more recent and it's in that grey area, it's how you determine, like you say, Richard. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. Um, yeah, it, it's it's hard because you can't be 100% sure if it is a bidirectional device. And if you code for it to be replaced, there's a cost burden there that might not be necessary. So this is something that's kind of been built into the regs and installs has gone on the last 10 years. And that is going to be the tricky bit of all of that, I think. Going forward, I do think there should be a logo that they adopt, be it the same way that you would mark the front of a, an RCBO to say it's a B type or a C type, just a common logo or phrase or whatever that they all put on there. So it's visual on the front. You can easily see it. And then we've solved that problem going forward, haven't we? We're just left with these existing installs. Because as many as there are now, there's going to be millions more in the next several years. And we might as well come to some harmonised agreement on the way these things are marked. And that was one of the comments I fed back. Well, if, if you look in the product standard, and I'll read it out word for word. So within um, 6.Z1, standard marking. So this is in the product standard for RCBOs. It says, if it is necessary to distinguish between the supply and load terminals... They shall be clearly marked, example being line and load placed near the corresponding terminals or by arrows indicating the direction of power flow. So that's a requirement of the product standard. So for the manufacturer to put the product standard on the device, in other words, BSCN 61009, they must have followed all of the requirements of the standard. That's one standard around marking. So marking and other product information. So it can either be you know, line load, etc., or by arrows. But the confusing bit is that with the Proteus one, it's got both. Yeah. <laughs> which is not helpful. Yeah, I can I can I can sympathize a bit for manufacturers trying to produce SKUs mm. to meet both of those circumstances. I guess if you think of ninety nine percent of applications where you'll be installing your RCBOs, Craig, they're all going in one direction generally. Mm. Um and not having line and load on I I don't know if they were totally unmarked. Would that be a problem? Probably not. So maybe they should just do away with markings. Maybe that's the answer. Well, I mean, I've got two identical Hager RCBOs in front of me, one being bidirectional, which is just marked line and neutral, and one being unidirectional, which, as we know, you know, via the uh, Beamer guidance document, it's actually marked in and out. So that's clear as day to me. Yeah. But equally, on the side, you know, the diagrams are different. <laughs> Even though they're both switch neutral, the bidirectional one has a a third trigger, you know, in the wiring diagram that disconnects the the coil, you know, the the sensing coil of the RCBO, because the the potential issue around it is that the bi the bidirectional power flow will, in other words, burn out the resistor within the circuit and make the RCD part of the RCBO not function. Yeah. not work so in, in effect you just end up with a with a normal overcurrent device you you, you lose that additional protection bit that's, and that's, that's the potentially dangerous bit isn't it when you're doing your eicrs yeah. if that's happened exactly. and it's yes. not working and and we don't know that yeah yeah that's the really difficult part um I totally totally agree i'm just thinking of the 
the environmental impact of producing new products with different markings on when maybe they could just adopt one way of doing it and just apply that across the whole range. Um, well, potentially, again, this is something as an organisation we can do is then go to the committee that write the product standard for those devices, 61009, and then, you know, include some comments within that based on the fact that, you know, it, what would make it easier for the installer or the, the inspector that's going out to do periodic inspection and testing moving forward is to make, you know, have a standardisation approach on what marking you're going to use. I do like the Proteus circle with the two arrows in. That's clear to me. That's, that's quite good. I do like that. Yeah. Um, and not have something on the side. But currently they can. They are allowed to have certain things on the side, certain things on the front. But, it, yeah, I think, as you say, it's, gonna, it's a bit difficult. It's not so bad if you're selecting and designing from new, from a start, because the regs is going to be quite clear, you know, when it gets changed, etc. that what you need to do is going to be a shell. Um, yeah. So that's fair enough. But from an existing point, difficult one. So because it's going to be a shell, which is where I was going to go next, you can't really be departing this from the regs. There's not really any other method you could apply to still be meeting the fundamental principles of the regs, which is what we have to do to prevent electric shock, right? Which is what I presume a lot of this is based around is preventing shock to people, not expecting it to be travelling one way or the other, thinking that it's just supply and one output. Would that be fair? I mean, that's the other aspect to it as well, isn't it? If you're going into enclosures, you may find voltages on terminals where you're not anticipating them being there due to the markings. You shouldn't technically be inside an enclosure that's live, but we all see the videos and posts to know that's not how the real world works. So that's a, that's another but, side to all of that. But even not if you are intentionally trying to work live, if you just don't understand what you're working yeah. on, because to me this brings a whole new education piece needs to come to the the forefront of this and is this being taught having not done solar and battery courses is this being taught on those courses because it's not being taught in 2391 i know that for sure it's not being taught at level two or level three or probably any part of the apprenticeship so at what point are we going to pick this knowledge up to basically understand that if you are going into that board and the solar and those batteries, just because you've turned it off doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be off because the batteries could be storing energy and you might have to apply that differently. Um, and I think that training piece could be a whole big potential issue from what I'm aware of. There's a lot in that area. Um, so much to do with the way you're earthing your supply source when you are in island mode, for example, and understanding how how that works and then safe isolation around all of this stuff. Um, it gets ever more complicated as the manufacturers make ever clever stuff. So these things are probably pushing the regs to evolve faster than they ever had. That's the other important aspect for this. Because a few people have said, why is this not a corrigendum? And I think that's technically the way the regs work. It's not correction, it's something new. And they're putting it through this fast paced way. And it's not, I suppose not calling it a proper amendment isn't fair, but usually an amendment would have a bit more to it, wouldn't it? This is just one specific issue that they want to close up with a little piece of paper that goes in your regs book and they can get it over the line quickly. Whereas bigger amendments and bigger changes would have a new addition of the regs and that takes longer. Exactly. So, you know, if this was a bigger amendment, it might not be published until 2026, by which point it's far too late then. If, you know, if there's, if there's a potential problem being identified, then it needs to be addressed now if that makes sense but that's why the dpc is so good because it gives everybody a chance to comment on it we will be doing that ourselves as an organization you know similarly search your world then i see you know everyone will and installers designers yourselves everyone can comment on it and um jpl have to take on board everyone's comments they have to but but it's no good just going and commenting and you know slagging it off or having a go at it <laughs> because people do it's okay, you know, highlighting some some points about it that are equally. It's it's all right having a problem, but where's the solution? You know, if you've got a better way of wording it or, you know, describing it or whatever it is, then include that with your comments as well, because you know they need to be taken on board. No one's perfect, uh, nor a JPA, you know, nor are the subcommittees and everybody else. So, it's your chance to collectively comment on it and, you know, get a sensible way forward. That's the point. Is this a little bit where the regs are damned if they do and damned if they don't? Because we totally. all know that they're out of date with industry, but now they're trying to catch up with industry. We're all moaning that we maybe have to get a new book. 
That's it, it feels a bit like, yeah. That's exactly it, Craig. You took the words out of my mouth there. I was thinking exactly the same. We spoke about that on this podcast before. People complain a lot that the regs are so far out of date and they're not really current and it takes five years to get stuff in it. And now they're making an effort to to do something reactive and it's uh, it's a problem for a few people. And um, that doesn't really seem fair. Looking at some of the comments that are on there already, some are supportive saying that I think it's pretty yeah. clear. So you can just go on and, and say those things as well. It doesn't have yeah. to be something... Yeah that you want to change. I suggested yeah. something along with definitions to define what power flow is, because that's a new term that's been used in the regs. I think a few other people, as I read through, had said similar. So even if it's something silly like that, and it might be totally wrong, just throwing that into the mixing pot doesn't hurt. So do go and get involved. But equally, what they're, what they're trying to do there as well is agree the same terminology across different product standards. So within the product standard, it talks about power flow. Yeah. So they're trying to align it with other standards and other legislation. And that's important because you get so many different definitions for a residential premises. Is it a dwelling? Is it a house? Is it, you know, and it doesn't help when you're trying to match and work with different parts of legislation and different standards, which I do quite a bit of now in trying to determine actually, is it the same thing or is it something slightly different? So I think, you know, that's what they're trying to do in terms of power flow. And I was quite surprised in that terminology when I listened to uh, to Mark Cole's little webinar that released from the IT was was sensible. Uh, it made sense. Um, and power flow, thought, that's a new one. He explained that quite well, really. It's not as such current. It's power flow in both directions. So, you know, there's been quite a few people done or released different different bits of information, which is good. So we're all trying to come together, which is sensible. So, And I was just going to say, I think if we can get one... Everyone moans about understanding and the terminology and the word. And if we can get to a point where we do have a set of definitions that do help us with the industry, then that in theory can only help improve understanding and take away any of the grey matter that people talk about if it is clearer and more transparent. And you read the electrical energy storage system book, for example, and that matches with what the reg says and you know so on and so forth. Yeah. back to these product standards and we get that information out there then to me that can only be a positive 100 percent. i think that the renewables industry has got a lot to answer for because a lot of these problems have been caused in that space you look at the the PAS document of late and there's the new guidances around energy storage in batteries that's come out from the iet as well we've got this amendment in bi-directional unidirectional devices and industry is making a real effort with that, I think, to try and stay on top of that curve as much as they can. Um, and I support it. I think, it, you know, it's, it makes sense. Let's um, get behind bodies of industry and parts of industry and help them make things safer. That's what we all want, isn't it? Safe, compliant installations where we all know what is defined as safe within that. Yeah. But get involved. Think... Don't, don't bark in the background. Don't get beyond your keyboard and make stupid comments. Then... You know, actively go out of your way to find out, get some information. Do you know what I mean? Um, you, know, you know, I'm pretty sure, Mark, that you'll you'll have uh, Tim Benstead or somebody, you know, representing one of the committees within JPOL to explain the processes. And Tim's going to come on with us. Yeah, it's brilliant. You know, I think that's so important because that conversation we had, you know, a number of weeks ago now, it seems forever ago. But that's so important to tell that story and explain the processes behind it. And people would be less... You know, hasty to to just slag everybody off and have a moan about it all because that ain't going to help either. So, no, I think anyone who listened to what Tim said that day would change their views. It certainly adjusted some of my historical mindsets on it all as well. I'm seeing him at Elex um, on Thursday, and we'll have a chat about getting a date sorted out for that because he's just been busy as we have. So he's going to come on and explain that as he did to us um, at the Apprentice One to One Day because that is really good. Little talk, if you can remember it and repeat it, I think that'll go down very well. But yeah, if you haven't already, follow the comments, go read the document, feedback your opinions and help industry to get this right. We do have a topic tonight that kind of fits around that, but in a more wider, broader context to do with earthing and bonding. And I think that's an interesting topic for lots of trainees and apprentices, and we're going to try and sit it at that level to begin with and do what we did in the design series and expand our way up when Craig can explain every fine detail of all of the earthing and bonding requirements <laughs> to us. 
Um, but starting out at the beginning, I've had a little look through this um, this green book. It's out of date now, as Richard pointed out off air. It's blue, too tight to buy the brown one. Um, but that kind of goes from the beginning of all of this. I think that's a really good reference, by the way, if you are yeah, an apprentice good. or trainee. Buying one of the um, guidance books is a better investment than the actual regs book, I think, sometimes when you're trying to really nail down into a specific topic. And uh, GNA is one of the better ones. So it's well worth considering they're not that expensive in comparison to the regs. And it kind of starts out with the beginning, explaining the difference between earthing and bonding. So I thought we'd start with that. If that makes sense to you guys. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. I haven't got it in front of me to help me, so I'll have to wing it and pretend yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about. You should know better than anyone. You're designing <laughs> this day to day, mate. If you don't know, we're all screwed. <laughs> so I think, I with, think from... with protective earthing, um, that's got a few purposes. It's like earthing the source and fixed and mobile equipment. Is that the broad definition of it, I think? I think even for apprentices right at the start, it's just thinking about earthing having your ability to give you like your main fault path back to earth. Even as simple as, I don't know about you, Richard, but when I was teaching, my favourite question was always, what does earth mean when you talk about the regs? Because we all talk about them as earth conductors or earth cables, you know, twinning earth. And um, actually with the regs, the definition is the mass of earth, right? So your earth and conductor is about taking your fault back to the mass of earth, going through the quickest path to get to that point to effectively try and stop an electric shock would be how I would put that one across. I don't know if you'd have any different sort of statements on that. Well, I always look at earthing for time. I relate earthing to time, but part two of the regs is like fundamental principles, really, because everything's built around it. You know, people get taught the regs because, you know, part one and then part two and then blah, blah, blah. And you follow it in a, in a sequence and then, of course, use part seven and eight if you need them. But ultimately, you can use part two anywhere or anytime you like. Because from my experience, you, you talk about fault protection or you talk about this, you talk about that, you talk about final circuit. And like people are listening, but they're not listening because they don't really understand what it is they're talking about. And I always remind them, well, look, don't be afraid to go back into part two there and just have a look at what they mean by a final circuit. What is that? And then you can see like a spark light in the brain. Oh, I didn't know they was talking about that, but you just said you understand what it is that they're saying you need to do. But if you don't understand the parts of that, then it's pointless. But going back into part two, all the terms that are used around earthing and bonding, it will have the definitions of in there. Uh, and people get confused with earthing and what needs earthing and what needs bonding and all the rest of it. But yeah, part two is the, is the place to go, first of all, if you need to you know, define what it is that we're talking about. But I always, yeah, always look at earthing as something you need for time because ultimately you need, if you're using ADS as your protective measure, a uh, sufficiently low enough impedance path to generate enough fault current to disconnect whatever it is that we're relying upon to protect us against electric shock. And it's a fundamental part of, you know, after basic protection, ADS. And it's, and it's for me, tying that back to people start to understand it, we do ZS testing, but they don't seem to understand the correlation of ZS testing back to looking at the earthing of the system and how you are yeah. going to get that disconnection to ultimately keep you safe. And yes, I know we can RCD or RCBO it to not have to worry about it, but let's think about from a design point of view, we're not going to try and design a system where we have to rely on a backup system to measure and we're going to design it properly to set the tone of the fact that when you're talking about impedance, we're talking about resistance effectively. And that's why for many apprentices, they don't put the, and sorry to apprentices, I'm talking from my experience with apprentices, yeah. you may be different. But the minute we put ZS on the board, you don't tend to put the correlation that Z is resistance. And in fact, in effect, the calculations to work out ZS is just the same Ohm's law that you were taught probably in one of your first few weeks in college. We're just replacing the resistance for Z being the scientific symbol for impedance, which means we're measuring the resistance of the path back to Earth to be able to disconnect. And it's trying to get that correlation to understand, I think, to help with it. And there's the, the three parts of Earth, and I guess, all function around that, don't they? So you have your, 
your source transformer at the yeah. uh, neutral star point or whatever, you'd make your Earth connection there. You've got your DNA Earth provision or your own Earth provision through an electrode, either in supplement to that or in replacement of it as a TT. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the three aspects of that that sit in front of all of that Well, then the final circuits doing their thing to take that fault current and enable ADS if that's what we're using. And there are, there are other methods, but generally that's what most people will be using um, for their uh, protective measures. So it's, it's one of those where you want to understand the process of where those electrons are going and how all of that works and getting that into your brain as a trainee and a, and a learner is really quite difficult. I think that's one of the hardest things that I found at the start is just appreciating the role the mass of Earth plays in all of that. Um, and how it helps your protective devices operate. Because you'd instantly think logically, I think as a trainee, that having a large amount of fault current would be a bad thing, when really it's actually a very good thing when fault conditions are at play because it enables those protective devices, as Richard said, to, to bang off really quickly. It's yeah. But it's understanding and appreciating that and then how your earthing system helps enable that. And with TT, because generally we don't get as good at earth reading, you know, that can present a problem and it's why we use RCDs to supplement that as fault protection as well they enable us to work with work with that a little bit easier I think where people get mixed up with bonding and earthing is when you start throwing in you know your water pipes and your gas pipes and they're seeing it as earthing and not bonding whereas for me I think the basic concept with bonding is all about magnitude of voltage and you're trying to keep that equipotential zone that'd be yeah. fair to say because your, your transformer is reference to earth isn't it your source is reference to earth so anything that's coming out of the general mass of Earth, which that is referenced to, has got a potential to introduce a potential. And potential difference is voltage, simple as that. So you want to reduce that to zero, if you can, in effect. And by connecting everything together, you are creating, in a, in a, in a word, a Faraday cage. So earthings for time, bonding is to keep everything the same, everything equal. As soon as you've got a difference in potential, you know, depending on the magnitude of the current that's going to pass through you, will cause different levels of damage or, you know, indeed may kill you. But going back to guidance note A, you know, the guidance notes are to expand upon, you know, some of the more technical areas of the regs, and they do they do that very, very well. But equally, there's some good information within within the on-site guide, you know, going to, you know, more so than, than the regs. If you, if, you, if you can work the regs and... I always work the regs, but I'm used to using the regs like yourself and Craig. But the on-site guy is pretty good. You know, part two talks about the electrical supply, your different common earthing arrangements. Uh, and then section four, earthing and bonding. What I did like in the Amendment 2 version, the brown version of the on-site guide, is when they pulled that nice little drawing out of definitions of the regs and put it at the start of part four, protective earthing. And it, it gives you an illustration of some of the extraneous and some of the exposed conductive parts and your various earthing conductors, protective conductors, and your, your bonding conductors, a great drop drawing and a great illustration that they took out of part two because nobody knew it was there in definitions and shoved it in the on-site guide. So some great information in the on-site guide as well. But if you want to dig a bit more, all the guidance notes are all really, really good, but guidance note out especially is... I think the, on-s really the on-site guide is one of the most underrated books that are out there. I think it's absolutely brilliant to just have in, in your van and reference to as a normal electrician never mind a trainee but it certainly is very helpful because it brings yeah. to life shall we say some of the stuff the regs maybe doesn't and for learners understanding the difference between exposed conductive parts and extraneous ones is, is another one because the terminology sounds quite similar doesn't it when you you took it, it together and it's easy yeah. to get muddled up and mixed up and we will yeah. delve into this as we come further along in this series about the sizes of those conductors based on your earthing arrangements and your supply characteristics and how they do move around dependent on that. Um, yeah. And some of maybe the misconceptions around this 0 0.05 value of your um, bond measurement, if you like, for want of a better word, where that's often misunderstood. I think that's one of the topics I see crop up most often on social media where someone's measured, I don't know, 0 0.15 on a bond somewhere and they're going to see to it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, one of, it's one of those, isn't it, where you, you see a figure and it sticks in your mind. So I can appreciate yeah. it to a point. You know, we're all at different stages in our careers with different yeah. levels of knowledge, aren't we? So I think that's one of those to really try and emphasize through this series how that does actually correlate in the real world. That'd be a good one to dig yeah. into. And a lot of it goes back yeah. to the, the unit that apprentices, full-time learners, whatever it is, do, which is a science and principles unit, where they don't see the point in doing it. 
what do I need to know this for? I don't need to know this. But fundamentally, it all goes back to some of the, the more simple, you know, formula and simple theorems, you know, like Ohm's law, etc. It, it, generally, it comes back to that when you highlight the fact that it's it's only ever three things you've got to consider. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, I saw what you mean now. It's simple when you look at it like that. The 0 0.05 thing, yeah, I don't know where that ever came from. But Definitely. we know that resistance sure. is proportional to length. So depending on the cross-section area of your conductor and your length will determine the value of resistance, won't it? If you, you might need to adjust it for sure. temperature. But again, little factors you need to consider. But ultimately, it depends, <laughs> doesn't it? Okay. When you explain so it that way. Oh, I saw what you mean there. I saw what you mean. Sorry, Craig, was you saying something? Then you froze a second. Yeah. Uh, did I saw yes. Yeah, so so guidance note three actually done a good explanation on this in the latest amendment review of it, didn't it? And it spoke yeah. in there around, and I'll get the distances wrong, so you know I'm sure I'll get criticised for that. But <laughs> it's along the lines of they based it on a 10 mil and a 16 mil bond cable, and over a set distance of I think it was about 15 meters. That was the R1, R2 values that they would get from there. Is what the 0.05 was predicted because when you start to look at tables for size and bonding then they should have technically been like the more oh, sorry a 6 and a 10 not 16 they should have been the more common sizes for the bonding being put to gas pipes and water pipes for extraneous um, conductive part and therefore that was the reasoning I believe behind the 0.05 and I can't remember the exact word but I'll get it up but that's where it kind of came from was they pre-calculated the lengths of those cables at those sizes to say for common applications yeah. this is what they would expect but as you say if that means you need to put a 25 mil bond in and you need to run it 100 metres for whatever reason it's not going yeah. to be 0.05 it's is it? it's going to change but the no. point is, it needs to be effectively connected to the earthing system, to the MAT, and as long as you can prove that, you know, then that's that's the whole point. You're keeping everything to, at the same potential. That's the point. Simple. I think, was it Mr. Mr. Cranis? I saw him on and Twitter I think it's for people. doing a post the other day where he'd said that the 0 0.05 value originated from the resistance between the clamp and the metal it's connected to. That's right, to and that's in guidance note thread connection and it That's kind right. of just spilled into other guidance as a result of that i mean craig on some of your installs if you're trying to get 0 0.05 you'd need like a 300 mil earthing <laughs> conductor and your boss is soon going to get a bit upset with you if you start specifying that everywhere yeah yeah it doesn't end up being ideal does it um yeah. and similarly think... there was the same thing around your step one of your ring final circuit test where you're measuring your little r1 little rn little r2 you know, there was always a thing to say that they should be within 0 0.05 ohms of each other. Well, no, you know, they should be of a similar value. They should, of course, in effect, if they're the same length, same size, then they should be exactly the same monthly. But that was just a myth again. It was, you know, they should be proportionally the same. And Graham Kenyon done a great article on that for the IET a while yeah. ago. I'll dig it out where they spoke about actually what measures should you have at different sockets. And how the and I think it, the formula is in the new guidance note, I yes. believe. I'm not sure. Um, and it's how we start to look at the fact of actually you've got more line conductor than earth conductor at different sockets and sizes, and how that's comparable to resistance. Because what's important, I think, for people to remember is a word you said earlier, I think it was Richard, and you said sort of proportional or inversely proportional, like the yeah. current and resistance are inversely proportional, which is opposite to each other. So if we've sure. got the wrong size cable and we make our resistance higher, then we're not going to effectively be able to achieve the ADS that we're looking for to comply because the resistance will be too high. And that, that understanding of them being opposite to each other, I think is quite integral for dependencies. But it comes back to science and principles, doesn't it? The unit that nobody wants to teach and nobody wants to listen to. And I don't need this. This is boring. When do I need to know about this? But ultimately, it, it does it does come back to that, doesn't it? It really does. And it's it's worrying sometimes. I know there's some of these new standards that are coming out in terms of training people, thinking of um, the one we've been speaking about recently, Richard, the T-levels one, where there's elements yeah. of that that's been taken out or perhaps moved somewhere else is a, is a better phrase. I don't want to confuse things further. But it, it's worrying because it is important that people understand this so they can design properly. I mean, it, you end up... 
running your own business at some stage, you're going to need all of this knowledge if that's your end goal. And equally, if you want to work up to a position like like Craig is or like you are, yeah. Richard, this kind of knowledge will serve you well down the road as, as an installer. So it's well worth grasping that opportunity while you're in training to soak all that in. There is never, ever a better time. And learning all that is the best. It's the most exciting part of it for me. I think outside of actually installing stuff, that was the bit I loved. And I'd encourage any learners or apprentices, if you think, well, I don't really need, what do I need to know this for? Ask the lecturer or the tutor, whatever it is, to give you an example of where you might need that on site, where I might need to use that to, to, to verify something or check something. And then you'll think, oh, actually, I do need it. You know, I do need to understand that. I do need to know that. How do I apply it? Because otherwise, it's just you, you're being shown something for the sake of being shown it. You know, you know what I mean? If you can find a practical way of showing how you'd need it, or, you know, Craig could all day long from a design point. But, you know, even when, you, when you're verifying something or you're carrying out a periodic inspection test and, you need, you know, you need to check something or whatever, there's always a way of calculating something or verifying it with a formula to make sure that it, it either works or don't work. It's either safe or it's unsafe. So I'd encourage you to ask your lecturer if he's got a, and it's not always that easy to be able to give an example of where you might need to use it, but most things you can. And you think, oh, okay, that's fair enough. I can see. And I think, otherwise, it's just like you, you, you're learning something for the sake of learning it, and that's not always the case. And I think also asking on site, because yeah. at the same time, yes, I know people love rule of thumbs. I know that they like the easy option out, but one day from what Mark was saying, if you're going to be forming in a job or running a job as a spark, even if you don't own your own business, your name's going on that certificate. And if your name's going on that certificate, you are signing to say that you have accepted that declaration. And I would advise people to go back and read what the wording of that declaration actually says, because you are signing to say you personally have conformed to the regulations. And that includes all of this as part of that topic. And if you say, oh, yeah, but we always just put a 10 mil in, that's not going to wash. No. no, really isn't. It isn't. We had an example sort of along those lines in a job we've been doing. I asked Nathan, who's in the last year now of his apprenticeship, to have a go at wiring up a matty pen fault detection board for a couple of 22 kilowatt EV chargers. And he did a really good job. The wiring was all spot on and neat, but he'd made one mistake that I've made myself before, and that's mix the earthing systems. Yeah, that's to do with the armorings. So the incoming, the incoming armoring is glanded yeah. into the enclosure, yeah. and the yeah. two outgoing steel wire arms are also glanded into it. And he'd yeah. done the right thing in banjoing them up and earthing yeah. them all, but he'd earthed them all to the common earthing terminal, as you yeah. would when you're just working by default. But to have that conversation with him today and yeah. for him to understand what we're trying to achieve with those pen fault protective devices and that's maybe my bad in not putting the time into showing him how those things work in the past before but having that conversation with him and him seeing that penny drop it's like yeah i get that now it's a yeah. real world reference point so do ask people when you are out on the site don't be afraid of asking those questions if you see your boss or mentor installing something and you think well why the hell are we doing it like that it doesn't make yeah. sense ask the question definitely and if they can't and if they can't answer you go and ask your lecturer and then come back and share with them why it's always good to be sharing knowledge it's a two-way street isn't it oh, if they can't answer ask mark that's how we are and how to get the damn things online and, and working so he had he was educating me on that front but it is it's a two-way street with those things i learn as much yeah. from people i'm training as i, I give back to them myself and yeah. it is important in that relationship when you are out on site to not be afraid to ask those questions. And the, the other interesting aspect to all this, speaking about earthing and bonding, and it's just popped in my mind again around your island murdering and understanding how the electrode works when you are islanding. So this has been a learning journey I've been on recently. And again, through speaking with Mr. Cranis and yeah. you two guys as well, amongst others, understanding how that electrode works when you are in an island murder could be different to when you're in your grid tied mode it's serving two different purposes so it's really interesting when you start digging into all of this but as a, as a base point as a trainee i think earthing and bonding is a really interesting one to push yourself around because there's a lot yeah. to learn and it'll really help improve you in other areas as well i think that's fair to say should we almost sort of give them the headline three systems i know that there's going to be more we're going to take it to different scenarios but almost kind of look at 
a brief headline of the three of them to then delve into a bit deeper and then I'd like to finish on my cable finding if that's possible. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. So from an earthling point of view, as far as apprentices go, I know people are going to say the different versions and now we're looking at Island and Mode and all of this. We will go into that sort of stuff and share our pennies worth on that. But at the base point of conversation, if you're an apprentice, you're talking about a TNCS earthling system, a TNS and a TT system. We don't tend to touch on IT during the apprenticeship, I think it's fair to say. Um, and we certainly don't sort of delve into sort of concentric and other types of cables when we're doing it. We kind of keep it more headline data with the earth and systems. And it's all about how it's combined or not combined in the service head when they're looking at the property. What I would like to delve into in the future is whether TNS actually still exists or not. I think that would be an interesting conversation to have. No. But, <laughs> yeah, I would say the same. But... Um, when you're looking at TNCS, we're expecting that effectively in the service head coming into with keep it on a domestic property for the time being, we're expecting that you see your fuse and out of that, you've got your neutral and your earth conductor are combined at that point and then they're going out and separate off in towards the insulation itself, which is what the C and the S is where it combines into the service head and then from that point out into your installation they start to separate to allow you to have your own paths whereas TNS we're looking at it comes off of the sheath and almost bypasses the service head to keep it as a separate conductor through your installation. You'll find lots of debates on what ones are good and bad and better than others and different reasons and strategies and I'm sure we'll get on to that but ultimately your service head as an apprentice is your telltale about what system you are looking at from that point of view and then tt we are looking at is not connected at all on the service head we're looking for your earth to be coming from your earth electrode going into the ground and i think that would be how i would want you to start looking at it. i don't know if you guys have any other bits you'd Probably want to put agree. on that yeah and again in, in part two in the on-site guide page 19 you know figure 2.1 2.1 ii and 2.1 iii um perfect examples of those three different common earthing arrangements very very useful they are detailed in part three of the regs but they're, they're line drawings as opposed to illustrations you know so on-site guide is probably the best way to try and get a view and i always used to encourage my learners to to go and have a look when you're at home find out where your intake position is ask your mom and dad is it under the stairs is it in an external meter box take a photograph of it bring it into the next session and let's have a little game and we try and identify what earthing arrangement you've got. There was a few where we couldn't really tell because it looked like a PME, but yet there was a, an earth cable sweated on <laughs> the incoming lead sheath and all sorts of stuff. I know that there was an electrode outside, so it was very difficult to tell. But those are your, your three common types. And again, you know, the on-site guide, part two, electrical supply, some good illustrations there, give you an idea. That's a, good, a great base to start from, really. I totally agree. I think that's a, a top place to start. We could come up with a couple of examples on TNCS where you were looking at a single phase and three phase system, maybe, and how yeah. that would play out in a design point of view. Maybe in a similar way to we approach the the little design series reference back along those lines. But I like that as a good outset, Craig. We'll yeah. do that on the next ones, and we'll maybe no. finish. We'll maybe finish with an IT earthing system where all the solar manufacturers can tell us how that works. Oh yeah, well I've got quite a few images, so I can always forward them onto Mark, and then. You can use your power of Zoom and, um, you know, give them a, a couple of options and identify maybe four or five different ones. Craig's probably probably got some more larger industrial type of incoming supplies and just identify from the photograph what earthing arrangement is, really. just gives you a bit of real life to, you know, check that with what's in the on-site guide, gives you an idea, then it's a good place to start. And I think the best thing that was said about that is when it comes to the IT earthing system and knowing mm. some experts. I know someone that hosts a renewable podcast and they should be bang on to that IT earthing system to tell us, shouldn't yeah. they, Richard? <laughs> I've heard that's not very good, that new podcast. No, it's a bit rubbish. <laughs> that's the only reason I started that is to glean all the information out of everybody who does know what they're doing. That's, uh... that's good, that is. It's, it's, I, haven't, I, I haven't, you know what, I haven't even had time to tune in, but it's something that I don't have that much experience in the real world of installing, etc. So, Definitely something I'm going to be tuning into, um, for sure. But it's brilliant for that, mate. Really good. I've listened to all of them. I've been fanboying them all. I enjoyed the one this week about the large commercial installs because obviously that's about more than the world that I fought in rather than the domestic world. And it was 
yeah, it was interesting to hear the struggles on that side and not just in the side that I sit on and understand from a tendering and build point of view and the sort of permissions and requirements. And yeah, it was it was an interesting lesson. I'd recommend everyone to go and do it. Definitely. Yes. Can I finish on my cable problem? Yes, please do. <laughs> as long as you're not going to ask me how to solve it. <laughs> well, this actually might be more of a Richard Street. But mm, that sounds good. <laughs> I yeah. found this to be alarming, stroke surprising, stroke. Maybe it's more commonly known than what I'm aware of, but I wasn't aware of it. So you get a cable standard called BS8436, which is a cable called Flexi Shield. And the general consensus of that is yeah. it's wrapped in earth tape inside the cable. Yeah meaning that it can go down walls and you no longer need to do RCD protection for cables less than 50 mil if it's buried in walls. Yeah. What I have found this week, which surprisingly yeah. is not commonly published, is it's only tested to 160 amps of fault current, that earth tape, and the product standard says it only should be installed on type B breakers because it won't guarantee any disconnection other than that. And so for longer duration. C, yeah, right. so you can't put it on a Type C 32 amp breaker, for example, but you could put it on a Type B 32 amp because that would get you 160 amps that the product standard is testing it to. Okay. I've looked through four or five manufacturers' data sheets this week and contacted them and looked into it. None of them are talking about the fact that this earth tape is not there, but when the product standard was read, which I was shown a snippet of, it clearly states in the product standard to only test it to 160 amp and only install it on type B breakers. But this is being used quite commonly out in the industry at the minute. And I wonder how many people are aware of it because it's not in the data sheets. It's not in the manufacturing instructions. It's all hidden behind a product standard, which how many electricians are reading product standards? But does it stipulate in the product standard that the manufacturer has got to declare it within their you know, technical file? I've only seen a very, very small snippet of what? a paragraph of the product standard, so What's I can't. What's the product standard? That. And I might be able to eight, help you. Out. Eight four three six, I think. So BS eight four three six. But my but my concern to this was yes. Lots of sparks are installing this and probably yes. putting on a thirty two amp breaker because the core of the cable itself complies with all the normal tables in the regs, but the earth tape doesn't, and the concern yeah. seems to be coming that it's a nail penetration test for this BS8436. Right. If somebody was to penetrate the earth tape, it was to slowly burn away, it would not actually disconnect a breaker of a higher fault current than 160 amps because it's not going to trip it. But I would bet my money there's quite a lot of this cable being installed in industry on breakers that are not just type B, especially in the commercial world, because... The use of it, I guess, was maybe designed for domestics to not need RCDs, but now we kind of need RCDs on everything in domestic, right? So, but so it doesn't really get into the, the commercial the metal partition walls in it and stuff. That's what they use yeah. it a lot for, don't they? In offices, office refurbs, isn't it used in shops and but, things like that? But with offices and shops, you're generally going to be on Type C breakers. Sure. And that means that actually you can't be installing this cable because it can only be put on Type B. And that's sure. been a real conundrum for me this week. Okay, I didn't know that. I shall, uh, I shall delve into that. Mister, Mister Pink Pants, Mister Cranis, would be interested in this because he, he likes a product standard and he likes a, a technical file and a bit of digging. But I didn't know that myself. The, yeah. the only product standard I've found it on is Amic Bell, who are the original Flexi Shield, which is why everyone calls it Flexi Shield. They state right. it at the bottom of their data sheet, but right. no other manufacturer is that I have seen, and I've checked a few. This is Amendment 4 building right here before your eyes, everyone. <laughs> Craig's just gone and done it now. But how did, why did you, how did you come across this, Craig? Why did you investigate it then, you know, for, as a designer? Why, why would the, for the apprentices listening out there, why was this brought to your attention? Because we, we received a document where certain contractors that we work for did not want twin and cpc installed in their installations anymore and they gave choices of other types of cable and before we yeah. went down that realm of using other types of cable yeah. i wanted to look into them and i just get a bit sad really to be honest so i, to I be went sad, looking it for it. 
so let's say then for apprentices listening let's say that as the designer you um designed it with this type of cable and you installed it and there were on type c breakers and there was an issue later on you know in a year time or whatever it is which proved to not disconnect the protected device and somebody ended up getting a shock or something as a designer then what you were saying earlier if your name was on that certificate in a court of law you'd have to justify why you've selected that cable wouldn't you yeah and then the product standard would be used against, against me to say you have not complied with this product standard because the regs does the... talk about consulting manufacturers instructions mm. yeah but it's not openly being published from what i can see which is the right. bit that i'm a bit peeved about because mm. you could be doing this the you would zs test this cable and the zs what? would test out fine because yeah the core of the conductor works so you'd never know there was a problem until someone damaged the earth tape which is a whole reason to negate rcds yeah and that effectively would just sit and melt away on itself over time and would effectively become a fire risk rather than a shock risk because the the core of the conductor if it got a high enough fault current would do it but if you do this earth tape and you say it runs it let's say the fault runs at 220 amps, not enough to disconnect a type C 32 amp right. breaker for argument's sake. Yeah, It's just going to sit and burn and burn and burn and burn without any warning that there's actually a fault on the system because it's not generating the fault current to disconnect anything. And you wouldn't know because the outer, uh, I assume it's LS, S, LSFOH, whatever it is, the yeah, outer yeah, yeah. Yeah. would you wouldn't see it, would you, as such, because it no. would be enclosed underneath that. So it's literally yeah. a two core cable trying to explain to people without, you know, it's, it's a three, three, three core, a three core cable, the same as a bit of flex would be, but inside right. it between the flex and the yeah. cores, you've got a bit of metal air tape wrapped all the way around. The it's cores. a bit like when the FP200 came out originally years ago, similar, similar yeah. type cable yeah. to that. Yeah, and it's, and it's that air tape that's wrapped between the outer insulation and between the cores that is the bit of the cable that is not able to carry a high enough fault current to do anything so if that earth tape wrapped around the cable yeah. is slowly burning away yeah but not disconnecting anything right that's better going to be the yeah. fire risk that's interesting i'll have a i'll have a little dig into that that's interesting but it just goes to show that you know designing is not straightforward at all is it you know, selecting and all the rest of it is not straightforward. Really isn't. And yeah, it ties in with the effing and bonding quite nicely as well. So yeah. well played, Craig. That's a good yeah. topic <laughs> to close on. I'm just going to end um, my little input into tonight's discussion to mention Elex, because I'm going to get this episode edited out in the morning. There's Elex on this week in Harrogate on Thursday and Friday. I'm going to be there with the Safe Isolation campaign and a board I've built for that purpose which incorporates lots of isolation points on both AC and DC systems and the earthing arrangements around all of that. So if you are a trainee or an apprentice and you're thinking of coming along, come over and say hello. If you want to go through any of the things we've discussed on the podcast, I'm happy to do that as well and just give you a, maybe a first introduction to some of the things to consider when you are looking at safe isolation around solar PV and battery storage and more widely in general as well. Um, it's at the Yorkshire Exhibition Centre in Harrogate, Thursday and Friday. Doors open at 10, and I hope to see as many of you there as possible. Anything either of you two want to end, add before we end? No, just thank you. I've enjoyed tonight, and hopefully we do it soon. Yeah, well, I won't be um, in Harrogate. It's not my turn. It's uh, my compadre. Dave will be there, um, mainly on the NIC stand, um, talking about everything that we do as an organisation. But it'll definitely be floating around. Um, He'll definitely come and see you, Mark, and have a spend a bit of time uh, on on your on, on the other stand as well. But uh, we'll both be back at Coventry after the summer break, so we'll be delivering our presentation again uh, on what's your excuse. Got a couple more to add into the uh, the bucket of excuses, um, and then we'll both be together again at the installer show. But I'll be spending probably a, a couple of days there as well to try and help out and support on the other stand as well, um, pushing safe isolation and uh, looking forward to Mark's nice little rig that he's built. It looks really good, actually. Great knowledge. If you're not familiar with some of these new technologies, I'd definitely um, get yourself over and uh, Mark won't bite, not all the time. 
No, nah, definitely not. Definitely not. Only one or two people get bitten, not everyone else. <laughs> We've got Mr. Clemens coming to Coventry as well, so it'll be absolute carnage. You have to come along to Coventry if you don't get to Harrogate. Come and see and Eddie. We should, and we should have the, the latest survey results from Super Rod, shouldn't we? So that should either highlight whether things have got worse or things have got slightly better. But we'll, we'll say that it'd be interesting to get those results and uh, looking forward to that. And because it's a local one to me, a lot of the people I've worked with, whether they're still sparking out on site or, you know, a lot of the local lecturers that I've good friends of mine over the years, will, will, that's always my home show. So I'm looking forward to that one. So it should be good. I'll be up, I'll be up at Coventry as well, since it's only yeah. sort of 20 minutes or so away from me. So it'll be interesting. Sure, it seems like it'll be a big... Well, I've heard if Richard goes, there's always a party, so you <laughs> might as well come along for that. Scandalous oh, rumour. Scandalous rumour, Richard. <laughs> there should be. As long as you get your exhibit around badge and then obviously you, you know you're entitled to a, a drink after the show but um yeah looking for looking forward to it. some good conversations again and uh of course amendment three will be published by then as well so that'll be you'll find that a lot of the manufacturers will add a little bit into their tech talks as well i know that hager still you know talk about your uh, assembly rating enclosure and bi-directional and all the rest of it so there should be some good conversations as well based on amendment three so yeah it will be and and to be fair to industry, they've done a really good job of getting the message out around Amendment 3. I will link to Mark Coles's webinar that I should reference because that's a really good, good explanation. And he did a chat with Darren Staniforth as well on that's CDF. Well. So I will link those in the description of this. If you want to go and hear from the IET, the horse's mouth on this, then you can do so outside of our chat tonight. I've loved it, gents. It's been great speaking to you both again. It's been too long. We'll be back again whenever your diaries and my diaries align hopefully next week um, yeah. to talk about another example. If anyone's got any questions in and around our chat today, please do drop them in below. If you've got any ideas around earth and bonding you want us to explore, please do share them because we're happy to oblige. And otherwise, we'll see you on the next one. See you, gents. Thanks. See you, guys.